Hey all, Tom Moran here from Tom's Big Spider as well as you've probably deduced by the title of this video. We're going to be talking about some of the terrestrial species that I keep that tend to do a lot more digging than your normal terrestrials. So I want to make it very clear in this case I'm not saying that these spiders should be considered to be fossorial per se, but what I'm saying is that I've noticed that right on from slings to juveniles to even through adulthood they've continued to burrow in such a way that it goes above and beyond what you'd normally expect from a terrestrial. So in some cases they dig deep burrows. In some cases, they have multiple chambers. In other cases, they continue to dig right on through their lifespan. I've got a couple of them that will molt and then turn around and start digging out more of their burrows or changing where their entrances are. So these are spiders that like to dig. So I recently did a podcast on this one where I named some species. And then what I did is I obviously put together the video version. Now, there are some species on this one that I didn't have on the podcast. There are a couple on the podcast that I didn't put on here. But what I'd like to do is just raise awareness to how I'm starting to rethink how I keep my spiders. Back when I first got my two first two tarantulas back in the 90s, which was a G. rosea and an A. simani, everything you read out there said to put them in shallow containers, couple inches of vermiculite, and they were good to go. And as I've spent more time in the hobby and set up more spiders and raised them to adulthood, I've noticed that some of the ones that are labeled terrestrial seem to prefer to have some more room to dig, and they seem to be more comfortable that way. So now I'm starting to take some of the spiders I've noticed have been maybe a little more skittish, a little more reactive, kicking lots of hairs, and giving them a deeper sub starter burrows and seeing what they do. And I'm finding a lot of them will burrow, which makes them kind of calmer overall. So to be clear, a few points I want to make. Number one, not all of the species featured here will burrow for everybody. Even with fossorial spe species, it stands without saying that many of them won't end up burrowing. I get so many emails and contacts from people saying, hey, I have such and such a species. It's supposed to be fossorial, yet it's not digging. What's wrong with it? Sometimes they just don't burrow the web instead, or they'll just sit up on the surface, content, and eat. And that's okay. So I'm not saying that every single one of them will do this. I'm sure many of you out there will say, hey, I have this species that doesn't do that, and that's okay. Okay. Number two, as I mentioned before, I want to make it very clear. Again, I'm not saying that these should be labeled fossorial. Not at all. What I'm saying is they're doing a little more than just kind of crawling under a cork piece of cork bark and maybe digging a little bit. They're doing a, a decent amount of excavating to the point where it goes above and beyond what you normally expect for fossorial. And I'm finding that they will retreat to those burrows when disturbed. And number three, I'd love to hear from you guys. Which species have you kept that you heard were terrestrial but tend to do a lot of digging, especially on through adulthood? I'd love that kind of information on here in the comments because a lot of times people watch the video they're like I don't know if this guy knows what he's talking about they go down in the comments maybe some folks will back me up in this I know a couple of species people have gone ahead and contacted me and said hey like yours mine have burrowed maybe some of them they don't but let's hear from you so enough of me talking let's take a look at a baker's dozen of tarantula species that are labeled terrestrial but we'll do a great deal of digging all right, to kick this one off, we have Megaphobema robustum, or the Colombian giant red leg, which is a species I don't think should even be on this list, which is why we're starting with it here. Apparently, there is still misinformation out there saying this is a terrestrial species, which I think probably goes hand in hand with people that talk about theirs being very high strung and defensive. When I first went to get one years ago, we're talking about probably 12 years ago, I did some research, I found a terrible care sheet that said, yeah, they're terrestrial, just put them in a you know shallow substrate, they'll be fine. And luckily, after doing some digging, I found more experienced keepers that said, no, 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 this is a true fossorial species. They love the burrow. They need deep, moist substrate to be happy. And I think that's why some people report sometimes that they have one that's a little more high strung because they're not keeping them correctly. I have had three, two females, one of which you're seeing here, another female that we won't see because she's in her burrow and a male and all of them dug as slings. They dug as juveniles and the two females continue to dig and burrow as adults. And I don't mean just a little shallow burrow, as you can see here, that turret, that dirt turret that she has, that was originally just a cork bark with a little starter burrow underneath it. She dug all of that dirt up from below, covered up a lot of that pothos plant. And when you see in a moment, the tunnels underneath, they actually go around two sides of the enclosure. So it's not like she dug down a couple inches and sits there. She will run and hide and retreat deep into her burrow whenever disturbed. So right there, you can see that little chamber kind of to the right. That's where she was when I started recording this. But as soon as I turned the light on, she basically ran to the or the chamber to the left. She ran to the right into another little hole and she's hiding in there so you can't even see her. That's how extensive this burrow is. So this isn't a species that is a terrestrial. Normally they will burrow. Now are there folks out there that have some that maybe don't burrow? I'm sure there's the oddball or two out there that don't do the digging. But more often than not, this is one that if you pick it up, especially as an adult, if you want a calmer specimen, you want to give it room to dig. 
All right, next up, we have one of my favorite species, the Bumba harita, a Brazilian redhead. This one here, if you can see over to the left, right about there, that's the entrance to her burrow. She continues to dig. She's a little bulldozer. And every once in a while, she'll dig a burrow. She'll sit in it for a little while. And then after a year or so, she completely renovates the entire thing, continues digging more. These guys, once again, tend to dig from early on when they were slings. They burrowed, juveniles burrowed. And then I had two adult females. Both of them were in these kind of containers here. I think they're about 11 by 11 by 12 or 13 or so. Good size. And both of them, I gave them starter burrows. And as you can see there, there's her burrow. Both of them went down and dug rather deeply. The other one actually had a burrow that went down and she had a little passage off of it. So again, not necessarily when we talk about terrestrials, a lot of times you can put in a cork bark, a couple inches of substrate. They'll just dig out a little bit in it. These guys here have shown they like to dig. They're little bulldozers and I wish I'd caught it. But recently she molted after she threw her molt out. She decided that her burrow wasn't good enough. And I caught her a couple times dragging dirt out. But this is definitely a species that likes to have some room to dig. And next up, we have one that pops up in a lot of beginner species lists, but I found that mine is almost acts like a true fossorial. It's the E. campistratus or pink zebra beauty or PZB. Wonderful spiders, but mine has been 100% fossorial from little slings. If you go back and watch my beginner species list, I did one on them and featured them. And they were slings. They had dug all the way down to the bottom. As juveniles, I gave them enclosures that were a little bit more shallow. So they dug until they got too big. And then they tried to dig. There wasn't enough room in there. So then I put this female into this container here, which is like the one we saw earlier. Probably about, I think it's probably 10 by 10 by 12 or so. And as you can see, there's that turret of dirt that she's dug out. She has an extensive burrow underneath there. And there's her little booty. She is almost always in this space. That footage I got earlier, she was actually outside of her burrow for a bit. And I managed to get her. She was not fit, happy about it, let me tell you. And she was kind of skittering around her enclosure. But I managed to get some footage of her. Usually she goes into that burrow and she has changed the entrance several times. So like the B. Harita we talked about earlier, she this right now, the entrance is in the middle of the enclosure. It was originally in that back right corner. And then it was originally in the front left corner. So she keeps changing it but this one has done a lot of burrowing. It acts like a fossorial. And here we have Sued Hopalopus species blue or Columbian blue bottle. These guys are awesome little spiders. You can see that blue booty that really pops. And this is older footage here because both of mine right now are burrowed and I can't catch them out. I try to get them out during feeding. Sometimes if you drop in some prey items, some of these terrestrial slash fossorial species will come out into the open to eat. But unfortunately, neither of mine would. But these are ones that they start off super tiny. They take a while to grow up, but they're so worth it because they're just beautiful spiders. But I noticed that mine went through a stage where as slings, I gave them room to burrow. As juveniles, they had some room to burrow in their containers for a bit. And then they kind of outgrew them and they kind of filled in their burrows, but they were a bit more skittish than they were previously. And you can see this one here. I actually got it to behave a little bit. But once I rehouse this one here into one of these containers, which is an eight by eight barbarous growth container, you can see there is her entrance in the back. She actually completely covered over the piece of cork bark I had. She covered over that entrance because she's in primal. And there she is underneath the ground with a pretty extensive burrow overall. And again, the ones that we're going to be mentioning here, I want to make it clear, they're ones that actually burrow burrow. It means they don't just dig a little bit of dirt out. They actually create little areas underneath where they can hide in. So this is definitely definitely a species I think that likes to do a bit of digging. And here we have my Pamphibedius species, Arania polito, or a chicken spider. This one, as a, when I got her, she was a three inch sex juvenile. And I put her in a container that really didn't allow for enough room for burrowing, but she burrowed nonetheless. She dug up a bunch of dirt from one end, put it on the other end, created a burrow. She has remained a burrowing spider since. And there is the entrance to a burrow under there. It actually goes, this container here is about 12 by 12 by, I think, 16 inches. And that burrow, as you can see there, goes in quite deep. So again, not just a little shallow hide. She is actually digging things up. And every once in a while, I will come in there. And if you can see that back corner, which unfortunately I just panned away from, 
all that dirt is relatively new because she recently expanded her burrow after her last molt. But as you can see here, I do catch this one out quite a bit. And she is obviously a very lovely spider. This is some of the footage I got when I was trying to show off her uh, burrow. I was kind of surprised she stayed out and about because I just included her in a video where it took me quite a while to get footage of her. But it's unique to know that this is right here about an eight, eight and a half inch spider. So an adult, a large adult that is still continuing to dig up and hide. So something to think about if you're keeping uh, Pamphobedia species. I've heard from other folks that have said their Pamphos like to burrow right on through adulthood. So maybe give them a little extra dirt to do so. And if you're not convinced, this is the Pamphobedius antinus or the stilly blue leg that I rehoused very recently into a newer enclosure, kind of the same size as the other, about 12 by 12 by 16 or so. And this is her before I put her in the enclosure. I was trying to get some good footage of her. But beautiful spider. But this is one that I actually just rehoused recently because she was in this container here that was too shallow. It was about three inches or so of substrate, a cork bark hide. She did not have enough room to burrow. Every time I would take the container out to feed her, she would scrunch up in the stress pose. And it was really starting to bother me. So I decided what the heck, I'm going to put her into something deeper that hopefully allows her to burrow and be more secure. I rehoused her and here she is several weeks later. I actually have this video up now if you want to see the rehousing, but she dug out completely underneath that piece of cork bark there and has herself a nice little burrow. And every once in a while, I will come up stairs and find her digging away just like the Aranya Pollito. She seems to be very content now. And if you notice, I mean, Sadly, I don't get as good shots when I take a peek at her now, but I don't care. I want her to feel secure. And I did the other day I came up and she was right out in the open. So this is a situation here where giving this spider more depth to the burrow, I think there's probably about seven inches on the back end of this of substrate, and probably about five inches toward the front. Giving her that extra room to burrow allowed her to create a nice little den for herself. And now she's more calm. And that's what it should always be about for the spiders. It kind of drives me nuts sometimes where people hear about fossorial species and not necessarily terrestrials that will dig, but the true fossorials. And they say, you know what, I'm going to give them shallow substrate so I can see them. That's selfish. That's not the way it should go. You should give them the depth they need. You will catch them out enough if you're diligent. And I will tell you, one of the biggest thrills for me as a keeper is when you have one of these burrowing species or a species that likes to dig and you come up and you catch it right out in the open. It's, it's incredibly thrilling. But there we go. Pamphos, guys, give them a chance to dig, see what happens. Some will, some won't, but at least give them the opportunity to do so. And next up, we have Zenestis Manis, or the Colombian Lesser Black. This is footage after her rehousing, which I believe is about a, a little over a year ago. I put her in one of the acrylic uh, 12 by 12 by 12 cubes. And here you can see the bright green moss. She has a plant in with her that you can't see. Beautiful setup. And I thought this is going to be amazing. The spider is going to absolutely love this. And I gave her several inches of moist substrate so that she can continue to dig if she wanted to. She was in an enclosure where she seemed to want to dig, but there really it was more of a terrestrial enclosure. There wasn't a lot of room. And dig she did. Um, the, the one thing I love about the set, this setup is I did keep the bottom levels moist, the top levels dry, because I wanted to see, does she want moisture? That's one thing that can kind of help you let you know if the spider is seeking more moisture. If you keep the bottom levels moist, the top dry, they will dig to the humidity level that they need. And she did dig and she seems to prefer those lower uh, chambers of her burrow. They're a little bit more moist than the upper chambers. But unfortunately, I don't catch her out all that much. So in a moment, we're going to see her enclosure, which is quite barren now. Unfortunately, you can see the spot where the pothos was. The pothos is dead. She dug out underneath it, killed the roots, so the pothos died. She also dragged out all that dirt on that beautiful moss, but who cares? She's happy. You can see she is underneath that cork bark enclosure. She is perfectly content. Do I catch her out as much as I did in the past? No, but it doesn't matter because once again, when I do catch her out, it's kind of a thrilling event. But this is a situation here where I kind of wanted, I've kept them terrestrially. They do well terrestrially, but I've remarked in many videos and on podcasts that when I open up the containers, I do get some hairs kicked at me and the hairs kind of are pretty nasty for me. So I wanted to give them a situation where they would be more content, more calm. And this has worked out beautifully. Every once in a while, I will come up here. She'll be sitting right out in the open. And sadly, I couldn't get any pictures of her. She's got some lovely purples on her femurs. But in this instance, I dropped in some roaches. She was eating the roaches out in the open. As soon as I touched the enclosure, she went into her burrow. But that's okay because the name of the game in this situation is making sure she is comfortable and calm. And I'm pretty sure that she is. 
And next up, we have another Zenestis species, Zenestis intermedia, or the Amazon blue bloom. This one I put in one of the barbarous growth 10 gallon enclosures. I put a piece of cork bark on both ends. She originally was using the one that was closest toward the bottom of the screen, and then she adapted this one for her burrow. Now, it doesn't look like it's very deep, but that burrow actually goes all the way down to the bottom of the enclosure, about six or seven inches, and then curls around kind of underneath the area where that water dish is. And in a moment, luck was with me. When I went to record her, I figured all I was going to get was her back leg and her booty, and I was going to have to break out some old footage to show her off. But she's actually going to come out in a moment to hunt. We're going to get a good shot at her. But again, another Zenestis species that does as an adult, this one here, and there we go, she's about to hunt. This one here is probably pushing about seven and a half inches or so. She still continues to use that burrow. And I do have three Zenestis species blues, two of which still have burrows. One of, one of them is in a rather shallow container, but once again, she was resourceful. She dug up dirt from the other side of the container, brought it over, piled it on top of the cork bark to give herself more depth, and then she hides underneath that cork bark when disturbed. So that's a heads up. Zanesta species, they're gorgeous spiders. Obviously, we want to see them all the time and admire them, but they are spiders that seem to appreciate some depth right on through adulthood. So I'm going to, when I rehouse my Zanestis, I have two Zanestis species blues that are more shallow containers. They will be getting deeper containers, probably these 10 gallons, it seems to work out for them. And we'll see how it goes. Do all of them burrow? Probably not. not. I've had some folks tell me that they gave their Zanesta species from the burrow. They kind of just sit right up top. But again, it's about giving them that option. It really, if, especially if you mix your own substrate, it really doesn't cost you all that much to give them a little extra depth. And right here, after I posted up a video about my T. Voggins, I had somebody leave a comment. Hey, does your T. Voggins burrow? Because mine burrowed. I'd never heard of this before. Yes, I had two of them. One of them I'm keeping terrestrially, and she's actually really laid back and calm. And that's the one you're seeing here. But I am going to rehouse her soon and give her depth and see what happens. But I have another one I've raised up from a sling that unfortunately we won't really see in a minute, but I will show off her container. She has always been a burrower. When I had her as a juvenile, I moved her into an enclosure that didn't give her enough room to burrow. She quickly outgrew it, wasn't able to dig. As we can see her here in a minute, we'll get to see her hunt a little bit. But she was very, 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 very skittish. And I recognized that it was probably due to the fact that there was really no place for her to hide in that enclosure. So I rehoused her into one of these here. This is the one we saw earlier, the 10 by 10 by 12 or so. And I will put links to these up in the description. As I turn the light off here, you can see her in her burrow. It's rather deep. She actually, this was not the entrance to the burrow. The cork bark entrance was on the other side. And I kind of angled it down and dug a starter burrow to allow her to come in here. But she ended up filling up the front and left a little opening right there, as you can see in the back. And that's where she hunts from. And when she was in pre molt recently, she filled that all in. She molted came back up and I caught her sitting right out in the open. So she is out quite a bit, but if I touch the enclosure now, instead of bolting around or kicking hairs, she hides in her burrow and that's okay with me because she's secure. Next up, we have a species that I never realized did a lot of burrowing, but when I did my last video on her, a lot of folks said that there's burrowed as well. Brachypelma amelia, this one here is pushing about four and a half inches or so, so she's getting pretty big. And as you can see, she got disturbed. She's starting to go into her burrow. She has a little burrow underneath that piece of cork bark with two different entrances. One goes in that way in the back, and later on, you'll be able to see where she sometimes slips in the front. And unfortunately, like a doofus, I was trying to get some footage of her out in the open and some footage of her using that burrow. As you can see, there's the other entrance there. And I stopped recording. And after I stopped recording, she ended up slipping into that entrance, which would have proved, yes, she uses a burrow. But again, when I put up my last video about this species, I had several folks come forward and say, yeah, mine burrows too. I didn't know that was a thing. So um, again, we're starting to, I'm starting to rethink my setups for a lot of my spiders, because I do think that a lot of the ones that we've learned over the years, we call them terrestrial. And when you say terrestrial, you think of the shallow substrate. I think they are terrestrial spiders. They will hang out at the mouth of their burrows. They're technically on the ground, but I think a lot of them do appreciate the extra room to do some digging. And as you can see, she is a stunning spider. It took me years to finally get to be Amelia. And I'm so pleased that she's finally showing those adults colors. Now this one here is usually rather skittish, but you can see when given the choice to be able to bolt to the burrow, they tend to calm down a little bit more. It's like they have that, they know they have that for the backup plan if they get caught out in the open. And again, unfortunately, I would have loved to have gotten some footage of her ducking down in that burrow, but I stopped it too soon. But you can see she's a lovely spider 
so ecstatic to finally have one and one that not just me, other people have said continues to burrow through adulthood. Now, here we have a Fonapelma Simani, a Costa Rican zebra. And there seems to be a thing with these guys. When I first got mine back in the 90s, I had one that ended up molting out and maturing male, and I didn't even know what that meant back in the day. But that one burrowed. And everything I read about the species said they were a burrowing species that appreciated a bit of moist substrate. This one here, as you'll see in a minute, is in an 8 by 8 by 12 inch deep enclosure. She'll probably be getting something bigger very, very soon. But she was uh, kind of about three and a half inches or so when I put her in that. And she has dug a burrow all the way down to the bottom, has cleared out all of the substrate, brought it up. So now there's probably about nine inches of substrate. She has multiple openings to her burrow usually. And like some of the other ones I mentioned earlier, and this is kind of a sign of a fossorial species, she never seems to be satisfied with her burrow. So she keeps closing openings and then opening up new ones. And I have found after talking to many people, unfortunately, these guys are very popular in the pet trade. And it sounds like a lot of wild caught specimens make their way in. It seems that the wild caught specimens like this one probably is here are more likely to burrow than your captive bred ones. And as you can see here, the two entrances to the burrows, she's down all the way at the bottom eating some roaches. I was hoping I could entice her out, but I couldn't. But at least I could give you some shots of how deep she is. This is a species, or at least this specimen here, does want to dig. I would call her fossorial. I think, again, some folks report there's dig, some don't. It doesn't matter. You give the spider the choice. So I like to give them a choice, especially if it's a wild caught one. And I have to say that this this holds true with all of the Afana Pelma species I've been raising up so far, especially as slings. They like the room to dig, and I've spoken to many folks that love keeping an Afana Pelma species. They give them room to dig right on through a juvenile stage, through adulthood, and they will continue to do some burrowing. I've heard folks that have Calcotas that continue to burrow once they hit adulthood. I have Nikki, who is now I will call her a young adult. She's still kind of small. She burrows. I have another Calcotas that burrows. Just about all of them continue to burrow. So make sure you give them that extra depth. And here we have Theraphosa apophysis or the pink foot or pink footed Goliath. Absolutely love Theraphosa species. And what I'm finding is that if given the room to burrow, they will burrow right on through adulthood. Now, this one here is around seven and a half, eight inches. She's going to be getting rehoused soon. I have a whole video coming up with my three Theraphosa species. She's the one that's getting the new home and we'll put her for the time being into one of the 10 gallon barbarous growth enclosures. But Beautiful spiders, big spiders, gangly, more gangly than the Sturmy or Blondie, but I found that they like to burrow. And in a couple minutes, we're going to see, or a couple moments, we're going to see my other female who I rehoused into something much bigger, the, again, 10-gallon enclosure from Barbarous Growth. I gave her two different cork bark hides, created star, starter burrows underneath. She started using one, changed her mind, went over to the other one, and then started creating a burrow there. And here we have the enclosure for my other female, again, the barbarous growth enclosure. I put in about four or five inches of substrate in it. I set up another one. I put even more substrate in this one because I wasn't sure if this one was going to dig. She was kind of out in the open. But you can see there she has a burrow that goes all the way down. It kind of curls around to the right. And that's where she'll go if disturbed. So the nice thing is everybody talks about the fact that Theraphosa hair is kind of nasty. Nobody wants to get hit with their fossa hair. And with the apophysis, I've found that when cornered or disturbed, they're a little more inclined to bolt around the enclosure. They use those long gangly legs for speed, and they're more likely to kick hairs. So once I put her in here and she did some burrowing, there's been no hair kicking. Every once in a while, I catch her out and about. She's usually out in the open, but if I touch the enclosure, oftentimes she'll just calmly turn around and scamper right back into her burrow, which is fine by me because, again, she's secure. There's no hairs flying around, and she's not bolting around the enclosure. And I do get quite a bit. This case, unfortunately, she's going to make me a liar here. I couldn't catch her out and about because I fed her. She went down her burrow, but I do see her out in the open quite a bit. And finally, we have one of the world's biggest spiders, Theraphosa blondi, or the Goliath bird eater. These guys are, I have two females, one of which we will see in a moment, we'll see her enclosure, is in a, I believe it's a 10-gallon Lorax plastic enclosure. This one here just molted. I'm fattening her up a bit, and she's going to be part of that Theraphosa video I'm going to do where I'm going to rehouse the Sturmy, the blondi, and the Apothesis. But as you can see, this female here is over nine inches. She is in the terrestrial enclosure, and I want to be very, very clear. 
She's very calm in the terrestrial enclosure. She's a fantastic spider, very well behaved, doesn't give me any problems, doesn't kick hair, doesn't bolt around. When I open up the enclosure, she'll kind of scrunch down a little bit, but then I feed her, she's calm as can be. However, what I found with these guys is that they do very, very well if you give them some room to dig. And it's really important with this species because this is a moisture dependent species. And one of the easiest ways to make sure that your spider has the moisture it needs is to ensure that you have a deep substrate because that will allow you to pour the water in, I make it rain, I keep the bottom layers of the substrate moist, the top layers can dry out, which keeps mold and things like that from forming, and it allows the spider to live comfortably, dig to that moisture level that it needs. And here is my other female in her 10 gallon Lorax enclosure. You can see there, I'm trying to show it off, there's a burrow that goes underneath there, and every once in a while, if disturbed, or if I try to give her too much camera time, she'll just slink down into that burrow and hide. But she did a great deal of digging. She also started a burrow on the other side at one point. There was a pothos plant in the corner. Yep, she ripped that right out, dug underneath it, then filled that hole back in, went over to the other side. As you can see the back, she's actually dug up behind that piece of cork bark there. What I'm probably going to do for her, and I've done this before with some of the species that I maybe didn't give enough depth to, is I go back and add some substrate over top of that piece of cork bark and fill in that back area there. It's very easy to do. I just put a cup over the spider while I work so she doesn't get scared. And I'll go back through, dump some dirt and pack it down. And that'll give her even more depth to dig in. But this is one that I noticed right off the bat, did some digging. I will probably rehouse her in the future. Right now, she's about nine inches. After the next molt, we'll see how it looks. But I'm looking probably at something around 15 gallons or so that'll give me room to put in about eight or nine inches of substrate for her, give her adequate room to burrow. And I'm thinking she will probably use it. But love Theraphos species. And again, for folks who are worried about keeping them moist enough, give them deep substrate, let them do their thing. So again, this is about me trying out new things in my husbandry and finding that, hey, you know what? There's some merit to this idea that maybe some of these terrestrial species that we keep would benefit from a bit more substrate. And really, what does that cost us in the long run? I think it comes down to some folks don't like the decrease in visibility. If you give it room to hide and it hides, you don't get to catch it out as often. If you're somebody like me that makes videos of it, it can make it a little more difficult to get some of that good footage of feature in the videos. But in the grand scheme of things, who cares? Are we here to show off the spiders and see them all the time or give them the best environment possible, give them room to burrow and be secure. And then when you have a species that does that, you will catch them out. Every one of the ones I mentioned here, I catch out all the time. And it's such a thrill when you come up to the tarantula room and see them out and about. So really all it's costing us is a little visibility, maybe some extra substrate. I tend to mix my own now, so that doesn't really cost me that much at all. And we have to put them in slightly deeper enclosures, which means maybe we can't keep as many of them. The nice thing about tarantulas is when you keep them terrestrially in shallow containers, especially if you use those sterile containers and I have a whole bunch of them behind me so I get it they're stackable so you can keep twice as many in an area when you start giving them extra depth which is usually about twice the depth of those containers then you can no longer stack them you have one row instead of two rows so I get it but I would implore people experiment with it see what happens take a couple of these species put them in deeper substrate maybe they dig maybe they don't what does it hurt in the long run if they don't if they do you're probably going to have a much calmer spider so that will do it for this one. As always, if you liked it enough to subscribe, very much appreciate Click the circle right up in here. I will put some more videos down in here, probably best for viewers or something else. If you take the time to comment, I'll take the time to respond. Just know it can take me a little while, although I'm starting my summer break next week, so I'll have a lot more time to get on this stuff and hopefully keep up with it. Guys, stay safe. Catch you all next time.